A human being can survive up to a couple of months without food, a few days without water, and 69 days trapped underground. At least, that's what 33 miners in Chile managed to do. The 5th of August, 2010, started like a regular workday deep underground. The miners were going about their business, digging for copper, gold, and other minerals. Some of them were working almost 2,500 feet below the surface. Another group was resting in the refuge, a room carved out of the rock for miners to relax in and breathe some fresh air pumped in from the surface. They were waiting for a pickup truck to give them a ride up for lunch. Around 2 p.m., they felt some massive vibrations. A massive bang followed. Everything around started shaking. Dust filled the air and the passageway collapsed, trapping the men inside. When the noise faded, the miners decided to make a run up to the surface from the refuge. Their shift manager and others joined forces, determined to rescue every single man. Deep below, two miners were loading rocks into a truck when they felt a burst of pressure. They thought it was nothing extraordinary until the dust became so thick that they couldn't see a thing. Driving blindly, they almost collided with their shift supervisor, who signaled them to stop. With the truck now packed with terrified men, they set on a treacherous journey toward the surface. The truck struggled under the weight of its passengers, but it pressed on. They met up with more workers, cramming onto the truck like sardines. Obstacle by obstacle, they moved to the surface until they bumped into a huge rock, weighing around 700,000 tons and as tall as a 45-story building. They sent the smallest of the miners to see if there was any hope of squeezing through next to the rock. He only managed to crawl 10 feet forward with a lamp in his hand and told everyone else there was no chance to get any further. Some of the older miners got trapped at work before, but it would usually be some rocks that a bulldozer could clear in a couple of hours. This time, it was different. The miners didn't plan to give up, so they split and one group searched for shafts that let air, water, and electricity flow into the mine. Those are supposed to have ladders to serve as an escape room. They managed to find one chimney with a ladder. One of the miners climbed up, breathing in dust and holding onto slippery walls. The chimney led him to the same rocky wall they'd seen before. It meant only one thing. There really was no way out. They had to deliver the sad news to the rest of the miners who went back to the refuge. It had enough snacks to feed 33 people for several days. Someone grabbed the snacks, still not realizing they could be stuck down there for days or weeks. Cans of peaches, peas, and tuna, six gallons of condensed milk, and 93 packages of cookies were all they had. The one thing they wouldn't have to worry about was water. There was more than enough of it in nearby tanks, which were keeping the engines cool. All the connections to the outside world, the electricity, the intercom system, the flow of water, and compressed air, have been cut. Men working above the ground on that fateful day also heard the blasts and saw the dust cloud in front of the main entrance. While the miners were settling in for the first night in the refuge, the local emergency squad was trying to do everything in their power to save everyone. One team went down in a pickup truck until they bumped into the gray rock mass at around 1,500 feet. Another team tried descending on ropes and pulleys into the chimneys, but they found obstructions at each level. The supervisor of the team took off his distinctive white helmet to show all the workers were equal now. As the miners remembered later, it was one inspiring gesture for them. On the 7th of August, there was another collapse that blocked the ventilation shafts. On the next day, the rescuers started drilling holes and sent down listening probes to see if there were any signs of life down there with no results. The maps of the mine were outdated, which made the search more complicated. Deep below the surface, the miners tried to keep their spirits up, talking, joking, and telling stories. Their phones didn't have a signal, but they could still use them as cameras to record videos about their survival underground. Their metabolisms were slowing down, and even the most active among them were sleeping longer than usual and having scary nightmares. There was a haze drifting over their thoughts. They spent 17 days without any contact with the outside world, eating only once every other day. Some of the miners started having health problems. On the 22nd of August, one of around 30 probes sent into the mine detected tapping. It came back with a note saying, 
all 33 of us are all right in the shelter. Soon, rescuers managed to deliver food, water, letters, first aid, and other necessary supplies through the narrow borehole. They also sent down high-tech video cameras that beamed back live footage of the men in their steamy, sauna-like surroundings. The miners invented a system of jobs and routines to survive in those conditions and remain sane. Above ground, an international team of engineering and mining geniuses put their heads together to crack the code of how to bring those brave souls back up to the surface. They came up with a plan to drill an escape tunnel and lower a capsule inside the mine, large enough to fit one person at a time. Then a crane would pull the capsule back to the surface. They brought three separate drilling rigs to the site and began work on the 30th of August, 25 days after the accident. The trapped workers were helping their rescue from below. They formed three teams and worked eight-hour shifts, demolishing debris caused by the drilling to reinforce the mine's walls. The original plan was to set them free by December, but Plan B drill finished working on a tunnel by the 9th of October. It took two more days to line up the tunnel with metal tubing. Finally, a rescue worker went down into the mine inside the capsule. The families and friends of the miners were waiting above the ground in a makeshift Camp Hope. The first worker got out of the mine after a 15-minute journey through 2,050 feet of rock inside the capsule. He was greeted as a hero. One by one, they all escaped from the refuge. Millions of people around the globe followed the rescue on live TV. It took less than a day instead of the planned 48 hours. All 33 of the miners, aged 19 to 63, had been rescued and were mostly in good health. They all had to wear dark glasses to help their eyes to the sun after being in a space with so little light for so long. One of the last miners to have climbed back up on the surface was Franklin Lobos, a former professional soccer player. While he was down there, teams around the world signed jerseys for him. Franklin got that welcome gift and a soccer ball. He said it had been the toughest match of his entire life. The incredible 33 were showered with love and praise. They were guaranteed six months of top-notch health care. They traveled to international destinations to talk as motivational speakers, appear in public, and explore famous landmarks. There was even a parade at Florida's Walt Disney World in the miners' honor. A movie named 33, based on their story, came out in 2015, featuring Antonio Banderas. He played the role of the miner who filmed daily video logs to assure the public that they were all right. This story, which many find to be a real miracle, went down in history and in the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest time survived trapped underground. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Let's imagine the end of the world has come, and there's no drama here. The apocalypse occurred not because of the fall of a massive meteorite or a zombie invasion. It's just that people built ships for interstellar travel and left our planet because they got bored of being here. And still, many people stayed on Earth. But they just overslept the moment when the last ship with Earthlings left the planet's surface. So, several million of these people were left to wander in a world without infrastructure, electricity, an economy, and the internet. What will they do? How will they behave? And will they be able to survive in this lonely world? To figure it out, we need to look at video games. One company beta tested a new game and then informed the players that after 11 weeks, the server with the game would be deleted. In a sense, the players controlled their characters in a world that was bound to disappear soon. In such a situation, all the achievements in completing quests were meaningless. The developers analyzed the gameplay to understand how people would act in real conditions if the apocalypse was to happen in a few weeks. It was important to see how the players' behavior changed as they were getting closer to the end of the game. Interestingly, there was no chaos in the virtual world. Everyone just played but they didn't accumulate experience and didn't collect items for leveling up the character. The number of tests passed decreased every day. The characters stopped developing. The players treated each other with respect. It's possible that, in reality, 
people would also stop thinking about self-improvement, their career, and boosting professional skills. A common problem would unite people and make them help each other. Such research into the simulation of the end of the world can help scientists and sociologists better understand human actions during emergencies and global disasters. So, let's return to those who overslept the departure of the last spaceship. And you're one of them. The first thing you do after realizing what's happened is run to the supermarket for food. Of course, you're not the only one who has come up with such an idea, so you meet many other survivors there. Now you'll have enough food for a couple of months. After that, the real challenge begins. Do you know the phrase that the strongest survives? It's wrong. The most intelligent one doesn't always survive either. Darwin wrote in his works that those who quickly adapt to the environment survive. If some guy knows karate and how to fly an airplane and runs fast, it doesn't mean he will win. Someone who knows how to hide from dangerous animals or can build shelter will survive. Those who are careful and who analyze and adapt to the situation will win. You need to leave the big city and start farming to have a food source. In abandoned stores, you choose books on gardening and growing vegetables. Also, if you eat meat, you will need livestock. When people left the planet, they opened the gates of all farms, so all chickens, cows, turkeys, and other animals went to forests and fields. You need to choose a country house with fertile land. It will be a challenging quest, so you train strength and endurance before you set off on this journey. You don't need to gain muscles, but running daily to improve breathing is an excellent choice. It will be much harder for you to survive if you're alone. Find some company. These should be people you can trust. Building a new society is much easier when there are many of you. You and your team find bicycles and go far out of town. Your water supplies run out along the way, so you go to the river. It's dangerous to drink from it because the water can be poisoned. You use special tablets that dissolve in liquid and destroy all germs. You can also use a bonfire and boil the water. You don't have to hunt to find food. You can find many berries, mushrooms, and edible plants in the forest. But don't eat the first thing you see unless you want to get poisoned. If you have no experience in this area, use special books with instructions about what you can eat in the forest. Always be careful and keep your eyes open. There are bears, wolves, and other dangerous animals in the wilderness. The bear is quite a cowardly beast, and it wants to meet you even less than you do. So in some cases, you need to make noise to scare it away. In addition, it's unlikely that animals will attack a large group of people. Great. You found the right place and started plowing the ground to plant vegetables. Every day, you and your friends go to the forest to catch turkeys and rabbits to create a small farm. You and your team have been working hard for many years to build a small civilization. The basis of any society is laws and rules. You write an extensive list of what is allowed and forbidden in the new world, and your descendants receive this knowledge. Mutual assistance, caring for each other, kindness, and love help the last remaining people on Earth to recreate a new civilization. Soon you get to know different communities, exchange goods with them, and even create a new currency. Of course, among the survivors, some are trying to bring chaos and break the law, but they are a minority, and as a rule, it's difficult for them to survive. In a sense, nature weeds out bad people. Humanity would survive in such conditions. However, if a global catastrophe occurred, people would have much bigger problems. Let's imagine that several large volcanoes started erupting simultaneously, and the continents got flooded by giant tsunamis. To survive in this situation, you'd need a lot of luck. You'd have to get to the roof of a tall building to escape the approaching water. And you would need to find a gas mask or a respiratory mask to breathe the air filled with volcano ash. Few people would be ready for that. Most of the survivors would be people living far from the epicenter of the disaster. When the eruptions and the tsunamis ended, people would begin a struggle for survival. It would be difficult to find food because the disaster would destroy many farms and supermarkets. In addition, many animals in the forests and fields would suffer from cataclysms. But you would still need to leave the city and look for a place to build a new life. Perhaps you'd have to sail a boat for several years, or walk around in a protective suit and a gas mask to save yourself from poisonous volcanic gases. 
But in any case, you would need to travel a lot and look for food somewhere. This time, there would be no forests and fields where you could catch a turkey or pick berries. Cataclysms would destroy all vegetation and flood almost the entire planet. To survive, you'd have to search for some canned food and fish and cooperate with other people. But would people be able to fully restore the population in such conditions? Scientists conducted some studies and found that several hundred people would be able to continue the human race for centuries to come, but only if they found a safe place where there would be no natural disasters. It could be a small island or a small town built on water. Our ancestors managed to survive difficult times, an ice age and volcanic winters. For example, 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, people began to engage in agriculture. Small villages of several hundred to 1,000 people began appearing worldwide. They formed marriage bonds between villages to expand their families. Genetic diversity is necessary for successful population growth, so settling in one small village wouldn't be enough. People would have to look for other survivors worldwide and unite in large communities. Only then would humanity have a chance. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. There are very snowy winters in Sweden, you know. Snow covers all roads and slows down the traffic. Some cars may pull over to the side of the road and get out only with the help of a tractor. This is a common thing. But one day, during a snowfall, something astonishing happened. On December 19, 2011, a man named Peter Skylberg found himself in a snow trap after he drove off the main road in the north of Sweden. Then snowmobilers accidentally found him, pulled him out of there, and took him to the hospital. It may seem like something common, but here's the kicker. It took two months to find him. And outside of that time, the temperature dropped to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. That man survived after spending 60 days without water, food, and heat sources among icy winds and endless snow. The people who found him said the car was buried deep in snow at 3 feet. And Peter Skylberg was sitting shaking inside a sleeping bag in the front seat. He couldn't speak. When they brought him to the hospital, the doctors were amazed. They knew cases when people survived in cold temperatures for a long time, but not for two months. A person can live without water for several days, but Peter had no problems with this since he extracted water from the snow. Without food, a person can survive for several weeks to three months. But what about the cold? How did Peter solve this problem? At such low temperatures, people can freeze within several hours. The doctors treating Peter claimed that his body seemed to activate survival mode and fell into a deep sleep. It's like bears that hibernate during winter. But the human body can only lower the temperature by a few degrees. This is not enough to survive in minus 22 degree frost. Maybe the man somehow managed to lower the temperature even more. The case of Peter Skylberg became famous. Doctors and scientists from all over the world put forward their hypotheses about how this man managed to survive. No one could give the exact reason. Many people claimed it was just a real miracle. Others believed it was the result of several factors combined together. One of these factors is the sleeping bag. It helps keep your body heat better so your temperature may not drop for a long time inside the bag. Another factor that probably played the key role was the igloo effect. Indigenous peoples living at the North Pole make their homes out of ice and snow. You've probably seen these round houses on the internet or in the movies. It's not warm inside them, but it doesn't let the cold in. The particular design of these houses helps keep the accumulated heat inside. Igloos can protect from strong winds, but it's possible to survive inside them only if you're wearing warm clothes. Perhaps Peter's car turned into such a house. Snow clung to it from all sides and blocked the heat inside. Many people wondered why he hadn't tried to get out and find help. But seems like Peter did the right thing. It's pretty dangerous to go out in such conditions. You don't know where you are, it's freezing cold, and there's a blizzard. Let's say you get out of the car and try to get to the nearest road. You fail and come back. But you can't find your car because the snow has covered it. Now, your situation is even worse. 
The only option is to start digging snow and make an igloo. If you have warm clothes, an igloo will help you to keep warm and gain some time. But the right solution is to stay inside the car and wait for the rescuers, especially if you don't know where you are. If you don't have communication or signal lights, then try to make a fire. Smoke can attract the attention of people passing on the nearest road. Peter Skylberg spent some time in the hospital, regained strength, and was cured. Now, it's much safer to be in a closed cold room or an igloo during the cold. However, if you're stuck in a severe frost without warm clothes, you have about 30 minutes to 2 hours, maybe even less if you don't move. But in 1980, a miracle happened that shocked people and doctors all over the U.S. 19-year-old Jean Hilliard was driving home at night to the small town of Langby. She lost control and ended up in a ditch. The girl decided to walk to her friend. She then saw her friend's house, but she didn't get there. She got too weak and fainted. Suddenly, Jean fell and lost consciousness near her friend's house. Jean Hilliard was wearing a light winter coat, cowboy boots, and pants, so she wasn't quite prepared for harsh winter conditions. There was a strong blizzard and snowfall outside, so no one noticed her. The friend Jean wanted to visit only saw the frozen girl near his porch in the morning. Jean Hilliard had been lying there for six hours. Her body was hard and cold, as if it were made of rubber. Her eyes looked as if they were made of glass. The man who noticed the girl was sure she wasn't alive. But then, he saw bubbles of moisture from her nose. The girl was breathing. He got the girl to the hospital. Her body wouldn't bend, so putting the girl in the car was problematic. The doctors immediately rushed to help Jean, but that wasn't easy. They couldn't even make any injections, as the needles would constantly break. The muscles were too stiff and frozen. Her body activated emergency mode and stopped supplying muscles and soft tissues with blood. All the red liquid was directed at the vital organs. Also, in emergency mode, our organism can slow down all internal processes of the body. The heart starts pounding slower, the lungs consume less oxygen, and the metabolism nearly stops. Such energy savings help the girl to survive. But the doctors were more surprised that Jean didn't get any serious troubles. She got frostbite, but the ice crystals didn't destroy her skin and soft tissues. Doctors decided to warm the girl with a bunch of heating pads. Then they finally managed to inject medications. A few hours later, she regained consciousness. The test showed that Jean was in perfect health. Meanwhile, you can get into a severe trap not only in nature and bad weather. You can get stuck in an elevator in a building full of people in Manhattan, and no one will know about it. This happened in 1999 with Nicholas White. The 34-year-old manager was working late in the office and decided to take a break. After getting some fresh air outside, Nicholas called the elevator to go back to the 43rd floor. But he got trapped in the elevator. It was already quite late, and almost all the workers had left the building. But the worst thing was that it was Friday night. Nicholas had no phone, no food, and no water. He pressed the emergency call button, but no one answered him. The cameras worked perfectly, but the guards didn't see him. The building was basically empty. Nicholas struggled with claustrophobia, walked from side to side, jumped, laid down, tried to open the doors, and waited for someone to rescue him. There were repair workers on the other floors, but they didn't hear Nicholas. Also, his colleagues stayed in the office where he worked. They were sure that Nicholas had just gone home. They left the office using other elevators and didn't notice that Nicholas had left his things on his desk. Well, Nicholas was in despair. He was rescued 41 hours later. He was lying on the elevator floor, tormented by thirst, when he suddenly heard a voice from the elevator speaker. Hey, is anyone there? Rescuers got the man out of the metal box, and the building owners paid him compensation for the inconvenience. Despite this nightmare, Nicholas continued to use the elevators. Yeah, living in Manhattan, it would be problematic to avoid them. Certainly for Nicholas, life has its ups and downs. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.